Day zero is the moment before company formation. When a founder decides to take the plunge, follow their dream, and commit to pursuing their vision of change. On day zero, you'll hear founders tell their story. From the initial idea, through reactions by critics and skeptics, setbacks and successes, we'll cover it all. Behind every company is a founder with ambition, goals, dreams, and wisdom to be shared. Let's explore them together. Hi, and welcome. I am Aaron Martin. Uh, I'm the uh, Chief Digital Officer and uh, uh, also run uh, Ventures and uh, Digital and Marketing at Providence, which is a large health system in the West Coast. And um, I'm also Advisory Council member for uh, Day Zero. And so I'm um, super privileged to kind of welcome Mike McSherry, who's the CEO of Zelf. And uh, welcome, Mike. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. And uh, and, would, and looking forward to the conversation. Thanks. So you and I met, seems like 20 years ago, but I think it was like, what, five or six years ago? Or do you, do you even remember? Yeah. Yeah. In, in that time frame, you, you brought me into profits. Yeah. So you want to just kind of tell this story about like, I guess, you know, what'd be great is kind of your journey pre-healthcare and then into healthcare and what got you interested in it? I've been a longtime startup entrepreneur. 25 years, and I've done, I've co founded six startups in that time period, uh, mostly in mobile and technology. Uh, some have gone on to become billion dollar companies. I co founded Boost Mobile um, in, in Australia and the US. Uh, I co founded a company called Swipe, a touchscreen keyboard that was put on several billion uh, Android phones before we sold it, and now it's on every iPhone and Android uh, phone in the world. And uh, I also did a startup that raised 400 mil and, and went bankrupt. And I can tell that story as well. Uh, after having sold Swipe, uh, I was looking what to do next. And I wanted to do something a little more meaningful. And I joined the board of local hospital system in Seattle that merged with Providence. And, and through that, uh, I, I got interested in healthcare and maybe wanted to use some of my technology chops towards solving some healthcare problems. So. When, when I met you at that time period, I was looking for the next idea of a company to start, and, and thus Zelf was born. There were, there were a lot of meanderings, as you know, <laughs> tell that story a little bit later. Yeah, I, I, I remember that day that I was introduced to you by, I guess, the CEO of PacMed, and he's like, you got to meet this guy, Mike McSherry. Uh, he comes from, out, out of technology, definitely kind of you know shares your background, and at that time, you know, is a little bit of kind of, you know, I guess the blind leading the naked. You know, I was, uh, I think, probably maybe 18 months into my job or something like that, uh, coming out of out of Amazon into to Providence. And uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what those early days were like? I mean, what was your first reaction to kind of, you know, working within, you know, a health system and, uh, uh, you know, those types of things? Well, I, I had been on the board of PacMed uh, for a couple of years, and at, at a board, you, you see big picture financials, um, you know, P&Ls and, and revenues, losses, and, and, and things like that. And as, as you and I got talking, like, oh, you should think about doing the healthcare startup idea. And I'm like, ah, uh, boards look at big picture things, startups solve day-to-day -day problems. And and. You know, I, I don't know what the day to day problems are. I, I'm not that close to healthcare, And that's when you invited me to come in uh, to be an entrepreneur in residence. But it wasn't just me. It was my, my executive team from Swipe. So four of us, and we were a ready made product team and we we're a we're great mobile team. We had just built an app that had been put on billions of phones. And so, you know, kind of tackle any technology problem. So you, you, you suck us on uh, stuck us on healthcare to think of like challenges. But, you know, quickly. Uh, some of the normal technology business plan ideas don't can't can't play in healthcare. And and you know a couple of examples I use are, are incentives. Oh no, that's illegal. That's inducement. That's you, you can't just use you know. Hey, I'll give you a coupon if you come into this appointment on time. Uh, another example was variable pricing. Airlines use it. Hotels use it. It's it's normal commercial operations like. Why don't you have variable pricing for prime appointment slots for senior doctor? I'm like, ooh, that hits hits a health inequality. So, so we found ourselves bumping up against uh, moral, ethical, and, and financial guardrails that that don't exist in normal technology commercial kind of startup ideas. 
And, and we had to understand some of those parameters. And, and then there was also a legal regulatory framework against you know, that, that. So as, as we went through an exploration process of the startup idea in healthcare, uh, you have a different set of boundaries than, than what I've been preconditioned to in 25 years of commercial software and, and mobile technology development. What were those early conversations, you know, given that you were new to healthcare like? How did you get through the awkwardness of, you know, like I certainly felt it, uh, you know, when I fir- first, got, you know, got back into healthcare, even though I'd been in healthcare prior and kind of studied it, et cetera. It's like going to a different country with a different currency and certainly with a different language where, you know, you've got physicians and clinicians, et cetera, who are all incredibly bright. And, you know, I remember just, you know, them kind of looking at me like, why don't you get this? This is so basic. Um, You know, like, how did you how did you navigate those early conversations and and kind of, you know, and and keep up the enthusiasm? Yeah, well, it's interesting you say that. And, you know, let's face it, doctors, like when we were kids growing up and going on to college and, and, you know, post-college, they were the smartest kids in the room. They were the ones that got the best grades, the best scores and the most studious and boom, they were on a rocket ship to success in, in their medical careers. And, uh, and, and, you know, I don't know about you, but I was a little bit more of a trailer in that regard. <laughs> uh, but so then when you like come to the healthcare system, they're still incredibly bright and polymath. Like not only do they have a med degree, but they also have a law degree or they, they also write software code on the side. And like, oh, my God, these people are so accomplished and smart. But yet they operate in this dysfunctional healthcare system, and it's like, how did they? How did they create this Gordian knot to untangle against, you know, the structure? So, you know, in our exploration process, uh, part of my reason for wanting to get in healthcare is, you know, I try to live a healthy life, and 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 I think that, you know, health leads to, you know, health equals wealth in, in terms of as you get older and you have your health that that. That it creates to you know, lifestyle and, and you know capabilities, and I wanted to be able to try and make that easier for other people to to try and follow in the footsteps. So I had a big focus on preventative type offerings. The world of healthcare doesn't, in, in the U.S. economic incentives around healthcare, doesn't really lend itself towards prevention. It's more sick care than preventative care, and and that's costly and expensive. But for, there's just not a lot of reimbursement structures around doing prevention and maintenance of, of health uh, in, in this country, or at least not five years ago when we were like tackling it a little bit more ambitiously. So that was my first lesson was we literally cycled through 20 different ideas around health, prevention, healthy living, healthy lifestyles, probably a little more appropriate now in, in a world of COVID and more remote and, and, and you know different kind of payer landscape structures that have cropped up in that time frame. But as we got on this exploration process, prevention was not top of mind at a at a reimbursement economic incentive level, and and I think the next you know consideration around uh, finding the right idea is, is know your audience. Uh, who are you selling to? Uh, because healthcare, yes, it's almost twenty percent of the U.S. GDP. It's huge. It's massive. And you know, startup entrepreneur, TAM, total addressable market. And you can go to the top down number. Like, if I get one percent of Americans, and you know, one percent of the world, like, but but it quickly, quickly subdivides and segments into like, who's paying for that? Is it the insurance companies? Is it the employers? Is it the hospital system? Is it the pharmaceutical companies? And and, you know, you quickly start segmenting into the world of healthcare is not, you know, a trillion dollar industry. It's, it's a thousand billion dollar industries and, um, and, and knowing your audience on, on that front. Um, and, and then we, you know, quite honestly, I, any startup, you know, this is my sixth startup I've co-founded. Uh, it's a combination of, of uh, ignorance and hubris. I'm smart enough to like, you know, crack this nut and, I don't know what the problems are, but I'm just smart enough to crack this nut. And, and you'd never tackle the problem unless you had that, that, you know, arrogance or, you know, intelligence or, you know, thought you were the smartest guy in the room, try that. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm bringing that muscle memory to, to healthcare. Um, but uh, you, you need to like persevere. And, and I say that because we were uh, talking to doctors like, oh, we were the entrepreneur in residence, this bright, shiny object. They're going to solve healthcare problems. And we'd say, hey, let's let's learn about oncology. So we try to set up a meeting with the 
on, the chief chief of oncology at Providence. Next thing you know, we're in a, a room with ten oncologists, and these people, you know, bill their time at a thousand dollars an hour. So I am literally going through ten thousand hours on a thought exploration. Tell us about cancer. You know, what what problems do you have in cancer? And then quickly realize, like, I am wasting so much time and energy. I don't have the the technical knowledge, the domain knowledge, the clinical knowledge to try and solve this. Unless one of these people want to join me in a startup, you know, adventure, I I can't solve problems in this domain. So we we ended up in tackling more software-oriented patient engagement solutions which fits back to my broader software and mobile and, and engagement technology you know, career experience. How do you think about like how much is is it important to to you for it to be your idea? Because I've talked to different entrepreneurs and they have different kind of views about that. Like, do you need to ha- to have passion about it? Does it need to be something that like you guys feel like you guys surfaced? Or just tell me a little bit about that. I think it depends for for different individuals. Uh, in, in the domain knowledge, uh, again, some some doctors have to solve that oncology problem, and they they have a different way of doing it, and their current job or institution won't let them do it the way that they want to do it. So they bring that domain knowledge and, the, and that passion that uh, to, to bring that to bear. Uh, I, I'm probably more of what you call a generalist of, of the six different startups that I've co-founded. Um, the first five, I was not the one with the idea. Uh, I was part of the three-person team that founded it. I joined someone that had the idea, and, and I thought that I recognized the idea had value and I could scale that idea. So that's probably my greatest sweet spot for, for myself is recognizing a good idea and taking it to scale at an early stage generalist kind of proposition. So that's interesting because like now that I think about your uh, your experience with Swipe, you had a co-founder, if I'm not mistaken, he was a scientist who their original kind of use case was um, was was more to help. It was one of these things where it's a very narrow use case that turned out to be very broad, right? And you you guys kind of expanded. Can you talk talk a little bit about that? I thought I think this is a fascinating uh, story. Yeah, and you know, all all credit to Cliff Kushler. He's the one who came up with the idea. He got a PhD in augmentative communication and spent a you know twenty plus year career building hearing aids and braille touch typing. He wanted to help people with disabilities communicate better. As the original flip phones came out, instead of triple tapping on a key, you could single tap and it would auto predict the, the words. And he invented that technology and sold it for four hundred mil. So he was a, a wealthy guy from solving a problem for people with disabilities that had mainstream mobile use. And, and while I was in semi-retirement, someone said, hey, people in wheelchairs that only have eye movement or maybe head movement, but no finger or motor control, uh, they have a difficult time entering uh, text. Think Stephen Hawking in a wheelchair, you know, blowing on a box switch or keeping your eyes directed on the letter A on some on-screen keyboard for two seconds. Uh, and someone said, what if you just did a continuous eye trace? So he literally worked on that idea for a couple of years. Um, you know, a keyboard that's only 50% accurate is useless until you start getting 90% accurate. Um, you, you, there's no way you can take it to market. So he had been tinkering on that, and I met him very early on. And in that, uh, he was about ready to start showing it to people. And I had a strong mobile background. And so he's like, you should start this company and join me. And this was pre-iPhone. So, you know, tablets, there was no market for it. So... Uh, next thing you know, the iPhone came out and the whole world of touchscreen input became a necessity and, and right place, right time. But, you know, historically, Alexander Graham Bell invented the, the telephone to help his deaf uh, wife communicate. So, uh, so there's a whole litany of inventions for people with disabilities that, that lead to mainstream, um, you know, applications. And, and so I, I, I came from Zelf. And or some from Swipe of, ha- of having helped develop the technology, it broke Guinness World Records for the fastest hand-free texting of you know paralyzed people. And you know I would go to all assistive technology conferences, and so I, I sort of got immersed in that. And, and that that is sort of what bridged me a little bit into wanting to solve healthcare problems at a greater capacity, and, and thus in my, my journey into uh, Providence and, and, and Zelf. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, Zelf. Like, how did you? 
come up with the idea, what inspired it, and and um, and, and just you know, tell us about that kind of iterative process, if you will. Yeah, you know, back to that free range EIRs, we literally cycled through seventy different ideas. You, you know, we'd meet with you once a month. Hey, yeah. so we're thinking about this. We're thinking about this. We're thinking about this, and you'd sort of guide us or direct us or like illegal, immoral, won't work, nobody will pay for. <laughs> uh, and and Epic, you know, anyway, the uh, we, we started tinkering around with the mobile application side of patient portals and um, and and we built a, a, a better patient portal, if you will, but I didn't want to be a mobile app developer. And, and then we said, well, there's so many of these digital tools that doctors or hospital systems want their patients to do. Read this, watch this, download this, use this to manage your diabetes or behavioral health or X, Y, Z. And so we, we thought that putting these third-party tools into this patient portal would lead to you know, greater adoption and usage. And then continuing to work backwards from there, there was no easy way for a doctor to recommend or click a button or prescribe or refer the patients to the right tools and the recommendation algorithms as to what tool is appropriate for what patient against what clinical condition or disease state. And uh, so then we built some tool for the doctors to prescribe it. But then since everything's digital, we round tripped and said, well, geez, I can track if the patient read it, watched it, is using it, what their device or app data is saying, and bring that back to the doctors to show. And then we came up with, so it was a very iterative process uh, that led to like, wow, I've got this platform capability that now can let a doctor or nurse recommend a patient do something digitally and then track whether they did it or didn't do it and then use that aggregate data for better recommendation logic to prescribe things. And ultimately, we thought that that would become a big platform level play. It, it was an unmet need in the world of healthcare. And the rise of digital uh, and digital health was only going to you know, continue to increase in, in the world of healthcare and, and hospital system adoption and, and patient engagement. Um, so we launched that four years ago, spinning it out of Providence. And then with COVID, you know, hitting and it just, you know, further exacerbated and accelerated the, the rise of digital health. So, you know, again, back to like Swipe, you know, we, we built that pre-iPhone and then the iPhone came out and that was sort of like this golden moment where every single phone in the world needed it. And and now I think COVID kind of accelerated the world of digital health and, and remote patient monitoring against, you know, app and device usage and, and you know, remotely mon, uh, monitoring patient activity. What was the thing that like, you know, surprised you the most in the first year or two, you know, about healthcare that you weren't expecting, um, you know, that, uh, you know, was just kind of the biggest surprise relative to your other experiences? You know, if I go back to, you know, doctors or, you know, hospital system, they're the smartest people in the room. Mm. Collectively, they can't make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has to be I don't know person. what you're talking about. I have never seen that before. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, no, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've never sat in front of as many smart people in, in, a, in, in rooms and environments before where they all had not, yes, no brainer. Yes, we need to do it. And yet it still doesn't happen for six, nine, 12 months for n number of reasons. Uh, and, and, and you don't really see that in, in the world of, you know, in mobile, you know, every single phone manufacturer has to ship a new device every single year. And that new device has to have a dozen new features on it to sell it and market it. And, and, and they're just on this absolute fast track and deadlines of shipping, shipping, shipping with new tools and technology. Whereas healthcare is like, uh, we can get to that next year. We can get to that next year. We can get to that next year. And, and that, that, Legacy debt of pushing things downstream have led to where healthcare is arguably the uh, healthcare, education, and and government are the three biggest laggards in technology adoption in the world, uh, or at least in the U.S. And it's crazy. You, you've got these MRI machines that can you know you know identify down to that atomic level of you know bone density structure. You've got magic pills that can solve diseases. You've got all these great, great technologies that are on cutting edge, yet we still use fax machines. We still make phone calls. We still go down to the lowest common denominator. Uh, 
which, which oh, you is, forgot pagers pagers yeah, we still yeah. use pagers yes yeah, it's just it's it's ridiculous and and you know some of that is is bureaucracy some of that is reimbursement structures some of that is reticence to adopt new technology i think people hide too too far behind privacy and uh and, and you know patient engagement and equity and, and yes yes you need to worry all about that but because 99 percent of people can't can't you know might might do something digitally but one percent can't well let's go down the lowest common denominator and do it the old school way just to make sure that 100 percent can't and, and no other industry in the in, in the country operates on that level i've been in a health system now for eight years and in january and like my observations are you know, a couple of things. One is they're not health systems. They're collections of like, you know, actually pretty, in some cases, pretty small, sometimes very large, complicated businesses. So it's not a thing. It's many, many different things kind of, you know, pulled together in, in a very tenuous way sometimes. And the second thing is, is they've been very federated forever. And so all the technology decisions were kind of distributed. I think there's a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with technology, to your point. Mike, that, that, that make it problematic in addition to the, the frustrating infrastructure and the complexity and of the technology, et cetera. And, and a lot of the technology is really old. And, and I, I delved into the rabbit hole of frustrations in healthcare, but, you know, I jumped in to make a change. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we were incubated inside Providence and, and we spun out and, and now we're working with over 20 of the, uh, you know, biggest uh, hospital systems in the country. And, you know, we see the regional diversity of these season, uh, these systems, and some of them have different, slightly different business models. Some of them accept more insurance risk, and therefore they have more, uh, you know, uh, preventative kind of uh, interest than, than others that are, you know, still stuck in the fee for service, you know, business mentality. So our, our solution needs to scale and meet the different needs of the different hospital systems across the country, and. You know, as we work with these different systems and we've launched dozens of different use cases, meeting different patient needs, you really get down to the atomic level of patient care. And, and you hear like really heartwarming stories of, of about individuals and clinicians and, and making a difference. And, and that's why I jumped into healthcare. So I, I like to see that what we built is scaling to meet a far broader need across the, the entire U.S. industry. Yeah, what was really impressive to me, too, is like after about, I, I would say about six months into the organization, you know, the four of you could kind of, you know, you, you had you had you had the healthcare kind of, you know, conversation down. You had learned the language. If you're talking to a potential founder who wants to start a company in healthcare IT or healthcare technology or healthcare services, what and they're not familiar, let's say they can't came out of industry like you did. What's the what, what are, what's some of the advice you would give them? Well, a lot of it depends on, on what their domain expertise is coming into it. You know, if they worked at a hospital system, maybe they have a unique insight to something that could be done better. If they worked at an insurance company, maybe they could do something better. If if they're a college grad and they have no industry experience and they want to do something in healthcare at, at the startup level, uh, I, I would really challenge them to try and build the software that maybe they sell to hospital systems or they sell to insurance companies because long sales cycles and very difficult and requires credibility and network connections and reference points, et cetera. So uh, know your audience and know what you bring to the table on your unique differentiation. Uh, but there's this whole world of, of direct to consumer and apps in the app store and, and, and building these, you know, viral solutions around, uh, you know, healthcare and healthcare metrics and gamification of healthcare and video games that are involved in healthcare. I mean, the Halo, you know, with Beat Saber is like game development is now in, in you know, a health and wellness category. And, and so, uh, you know, just know what you're bringing in your unique differentiation and, and what is going to uh, help you at the distribution level. At healthcare, it, everything is distribution. Who are you selling to? What's the velocity of that sale? And, you know, in a direct to consumer world, you know, it's a little more against marketing and, and the actual app itself or, or the game itself or the price point or the network effects or whatever. But if you're going into corporate sales, i.e. employers, payers, you know, hospital systems, you know, bring bring that credibility uh, back and behind you, because if you're just attacking it fresh, 
you just think, oh, I'm going to solve healthcare and, you know, come at it with, you know, green novice background. Good luck to you. I don't, I'm not sure you're going to go far. I was lucky. I was smart enough to partner with Providence. And then my first investors were, were all hospital systems. And, and now I, I literally have one VC um, and 20 strategic investors. I didn't have credibility in healthcare. How was I going to gain credibility in healthcare? I literally have the biggest hospital systems in the country, the biggest pharmaceutical uh, you know, player in the in the world, Novartis, the biggest electronic medical record company, Cerner, the, the biggest medical device company, Philips. I literally have the biggest names in healthcare backing what we're doing. And, and that gives me credibility that I did not have at a career level coming into trying to solve and it also provides you with a ton of learning. Like in our board meetings, I can tell you that you ask incredibly good questions and challenge some of, you know, our team, the Cerner team and whoever else. And, and you're able to get access to that infor- that knowledge as well. You know, Zelt has been incredibly successful. Like you said, your last round that you just landed, um, led by a health system uh, syndicated with several. How many other health systems kind of participated? Fifteen hospital systems. There you go. There you go. I mean, I think that's a huge endorsement of your your your, your platform. Where where are you taking Zelf next? What's the next you know the next step for it? Uh, well, just like the swipe keyboard was put on every iPhone and Android in the world, I want this technology to be on in every single doctor's you know prescribing interface in in, in the country. I'll start with the U.S. first, but I, I've always done global. You know, in, in, in my life, I, I I would love to see this you know broaden to international, but uh, the U.S. market is big enough and, and there's no problems to solve here in the U.S. And, and so that's where we are there. So, you know, continue to expand landing the number of hospital systems is, is priority number one. The, the number of different digital tools that we've embedded to let doctors prescribe. I and mean, we've done 50 some different you know tools, article vendors, video vendors, content vendors, apps for maternity care, diabetes, behavioral health, surgical prep. PTOT recovery, uh, joint limb, you know, sort of uh, rehabilitation, devices around diabetes tracking, sleep apnea tracking, um, you know, RPM platforms around cardio cardio monitors, and then just we've I, I love this category, and this goes back to the prevention, and we'll see how far it scales. But we have prescribed transportation rides to patients to get them to appointments. We have done meal delivery services. For post-op recovery, uh, we, we've been in conversations around at-risk pregnant moms, giving them healthy, fresh foods for better nutrition. Uh, so, so when I say we, we can prescribe digital X, that X doesn't have to be digital. We digitally facilitate care. So prescribing a ride, prescribing meal delivery, prescribing uh, e-com products for uh, maternity care. These are all facilitated with our platform. And I would love to see that bridge a little bit more into the social determinant of health and, and that, you know, patient populations in the country. And it's sort of why I jumped into healthcare is I wanted to like, you know, try and solve a big problem. That's awesome. Well, hey, Mike, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me. I know you're incredibly busy given the uh, the the... <laughs> The, uh, and, and we just got out of a board meeting yesterday. I know for a fact you're incredibly busy. So thank you so much for the time. And, and uh, uh, again, like I, it's just always so fun to talk to you. And you've got such a huge depth of experience. And, and we're super fortunate that you're applying it to health healthcare. So thank you so much. No, thank you. And, and you know, I, you gave me the start, the opportunity to, to try something in healthcare. So, you know, huge kudos, kudos and thanks to you and Providence for we're taking a flyer on, on a team that didn't have a background and, and on the hope, prayer, bet that we would do something meaningful in healthcare and hopefully we're proving you right. 